do we have the presentation? The, do you want to put the presentation up? Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> democratic market societies are in crisis and sorry this is uh, uh, something is moving unnecessarily there we are uh, democratic market societies are in crisis and the fact that we're observing it in countries that do not have the same extreme inequality that we've seen in the United States if you remember from Joe's presentation on Friday, France is one of the handful of countries on that OECD graph that hasn't actually seen uh, inequality uh, increase. Uh, suggests that something is happening here that is um, uh, specifically on identity threat and a rejection of pluralism and cosmopolitanism as uh, uh, core ideals. But you can't ignore the fact that the major uh, political successes have happened in the two countries that are the most extreme outliers on questions of the increase in the top 1% uh, share of national income and the uh, uh, decrease in uh, top marginal tax rate. So that essentially, if we look, for example, this is from a study I did of, of uh, one and a quarter million stories in the year and a half before the election. Uh, this is references to uh, uh, media sentences. It's clear that Trump succeeded in talking about immigration together with jobs and trade in a way that Clinton was all about scandals. So something about economic insecurity is central combined with identity threat. And I'll run quickly through these because Joe gave all of the numbers. One inflection point is 73 with the, st with the uh, uh, stagnation of median income. <clears throat> Another is 1980 uh, with the rise of the top, uh, 10 per uh, the top 10 percent. In particular, if you see the breakdown of the top 10 percent, the effect is of the top 1 percent, not the 90 to 95 or 95 to 99. Importantly, politically, you see this rise, this is data just for the US, you see this rise throughout both the Reagan, Thatcher, and Clinton, Blair, uh, Bush uh, regime, so that it's perhaps not surprising that the winners of the money primary did not end up the winners of the enormous populist appeal against this dramatic extraction of value by the top 1% and uh, smaller portions, and the stagnation of middle class and working class wages. When you combine this with the fact that uh, uh, the white working class in the U.S. is dying, as Joe explained in detail on Friday from the Case and Deaton uh, paper, it's not surprising that this is what they chose. Other things that are related to that uh, uh, particular inflection point, this is CEO compensation in the broken line and S&P 500 in the solid line from Friedman and Sachs 2010. Uh, what you see again, a little after 1980, an inflection point. This is on a log-log scale. Similarly for wages in finance, as they correlate to uh, 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 education, deregulation, and comparing engineers and uh, 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 finance, what you see is finance gets a highly extractive above uh, other, say, engineering uh, returns, and it's highly correlated to, um, um, <coughs> uh, to uh, uh, deregulation, which is what you see, oh, doesn't, doesn't show up on this. Uh, uh, but if you see the green line on the top right-hand corner, you see that it happens in 1980, before Reagan, and that plays an important role in the politics as we move forward. Let me try to offer a very broad, historical and methodological uh, uh, background for then in the second half of the presentation moving specifically to what I see as the emergence of the open social economy. So if you imagine three periods and depending on whether you think Taylorism is a good place to start or whether you think 1946 with high modernism is a good place to start, you could begin the period in 1911 or in 1946. Certainly it ends with the beginning of the great inflation in 1973 or at least the first peak. Um, and to think about how multiple systems, knowledge and epistemology, norms in terms of informal social norms, 
politics, organizational practices, formal law, and technology integrate with each other throughout each of these periods, the first period till 73, the second period till, from 73 to the Great Recession, maybe, this is the question, and the third period is the present where we have a series of uh, competing alternatives, one of which is the xenophobic economic nationalism that we're going, uh, uh, that we're seeing everywhere, and the critical question is what is our alternative? Uh, and I will, that's where I will suggest that network pragmatism or the open social economy is uh, the answer. So a little bit on uh, the early period, just a little bit because I think this is the best known. Um, in, critically, the epistemology is that you know the world by observing it, standardizing your observations to a small set of uh, discrete inputs, and then forcing the world to comport with your observations. So this is Prussian forestry in the mid-19th century. This is most importantly uh, Taylorism uh, in 1911, embedded in a technology of the assembly line in 1913. Um, but the critical un understanding is that you can standardize the world without losing so much information about its actual diversity, such that you can know it, transmit the information up a hierarchy, and impose through authority a well-ordered solution to the problem of production and social order. A set of values around organic solidarity, around authority, you see the emergence organizationally of state and market bureaucracies, the primary unions and associations as, as social uh, organizations. You see values of loyalty and competence emerging both in business as the good company man, in the family as the good family man. You see managerialism as the critical idea in management science. The primary legal mode is regulation. The detailed expert development of detailed control of many processes. And the assembly line and broadcast are obviously the critical technologies uh, associated in this case. Um, um, uh, I associate them by calling them iron cage progressivism with Weber in terms of the organization and with the American ameliorative uh, push that we see in freedom from want in the classic uh, Christian family uh, as we see in the image from Norman Rockwell. The critical uh, um, a crash of epistemologies, the one that was presented uh, um, uh, by, by the first presentation, is with Hayek. And with the rejection of the possibility of knowing the world through standardization, but rather the necessity of enabling free choice in markets. The critical epistemological move is to imagine that prices are an accurate and sufficient signal of information to allow decentralized coordination to achieve a well-functioning uh, and well-ordered society. And the conceit is that there is a set of institutional interventions, most clearly by converting as much as possible into ideal property and contract, that will allow for those signals to order society spontaneously. Um, here you see the rational actor uh, as well modeled by a self-interested material, not that they all are, but that they are well modeled by it, that it is a sufficient model for predicting interventions, uh, self-interest uh, self with guile, um, and that <coughs> um, uh, collective action is tragic, therefore privatization. But critically, all, uh, the model is not state-centric, but market-centric. Um, Critically, however, you also see in the 60s the emergence of the new left and the critique of authority from a left rather than a right perspective. Um, and pluralism and cosmopolitanism actually can coexist well with globalization and free trade because they, have, they share a similar set of commitments about the role of the individual. Politically, you see the rise of self-conscious organized business inventing, investing in the professionalization of politics, though this happens in the US before Reagan, as Pearson and Hacker showed, but in the UK only after Thatcher in response to uh, multinationalism. You see the values of self-actualization alongside competition and achievement emerging in the two frameworks, um, and you see creativity in markets um, uh, education and equal opportunity equaling merits in, merit in markets as the progressive model. 
ideals of free markets, shareholder values, superstars, labor casualization, offshoring and financialization. The critical institution, formal institutions are deregulation, property and contract. And the critical technology is the personal computer and the spreadsheet, which are critical for the information flows and processing necessary, both to control global supply chains and to create the complex economic problems. You can't have a collateralized mortgage obligation without, be, without a personal computer and Lotus 1, 2, 3. And they emerge, co-emerge in 83 together with their uh, beginning of the, their use. One zoom in one story. Remember the green line of direct financial deregulation starts in 1980. It's actually under Carter, not under Reagan, and it responds to dynamics in the 70s and not dynamics in the 80s. And that's an, that offers an important insight. So the story of neoliberalism, beautifully done by Daniel Stedman Jones, for example, in Masters of the Universe, by Steve Tellis in the Rise of Law and Economics Movement, uh, you see the idea. We talked about Hayek and Friedman, and, and Friedman in terms of freedom from markets, but it's not just the individuals or the ideas. It's embedded in a set of institutions foundations that are able to fund the Committee on Social Thought, uh, Aaron Directors Center uh, in, in Chicago at the law school, um, uh, the Virginia School, George Mason, Stiegler, Buchanan, creating, translating the uh, logic of collective action into agency capture and state authority suspect. All of these create the foundations, the intellectual foundations for deregulation that we see in the 70s. However, What's less understood, and this is a different paper, not this one, um, um, is that the deregulation, and this is again a focus on the US, was driven by Democrats led by Ted Kennedy. Um, <clears throat> and they're driven by the consumers movement of an understanding that the state is corruptly captured by business groups. And therefore, that competition serves consumers and crony capitalism helps big business. The Nader Raiders were a set of, of uh, elite students who actually explored and exposed all of these uh, frameworks. And you see in each of the, when you read the committee hearings on each of the major deregulation efforts, you see uh, uh, the consumers movement. Uh, the consumer saver becomes the primary person, the primary object of deregulation in the great inflation. Uh, the consumer, and whereas the unions line up with the incumbents to prevent deregulation, and you see the split between consumers and workers in the model. So essentially, when the great inflation shocks the system and shocks confidence in planning the combination of both the new left and consumer movement critique and the neoliberal liberal effort of uh, uh, 30 years before that combined to make this the one thing on which everyone can agree and the beginning of losses of labor. This then adds the emergence of organized business, that is to say what, what uh, Hacker and Pearson have written about in Winner Take All Politics, that is then both feeding the organizations and think tanks that emerged within the neoliberal ecosystem and begins to fund differentially Republicans and Democrats in order to feed the uh, uh, support. So <clears throat> I'll very quickly skip over another example. The critical thing here that I want to emphasize mechanistically is the combination of individual actors within organizational systems operating both at fundamental ideas about how human behavior happens as well as at practical meso level organizational models for how organizations function to change the day-to-day -day practice in firms of what executive compensation is, of what an appropriate wage is, of how casual labor has to be as opposed to how stable. And it, these changes then ramify into both the insecurity and stagnation and weakness in bargaining power of the middle and working class and the extraction at the very top. I'll quickly skip the second example, which, because it's primarily about um, um, method, and identify two points, and then move in the second half of the presentation to talk about the open social economy, peer production. Um, so critically here, what I want to identify for you is that the other thing that happens is broad culture. You look at 1951 at a handbook, 
the board of directors before approving executive pay may well consider the effect on the company's next collective bargaining negotiation. Moving in 89 to it doesn't matter how much you pay, it matters how. You look at Galbraith in 67, what does he write? Management does not go out ruthlessly to reward itself. A sound management is expected to exercise restraint. 11 years later, Maccabee and the gamesman is already writing, a new type of corporate leader, the gamesman pursues fame and glory, gaining victories, exhilaration. What you see is both high culture transition, this is Google Engram number of appearances in books uh, in American English of terms like agency theory and shareholder value, same inflection point as the change in distribution, Superstar, as an idea, emerges 10 years earlier in 65, and it comes actually from popular culture. It comes from, uh, this is a study I did of, of New York Times references to Superstar. It comes from Andy Warhol in the first few years. It generalizes to various others. It connects millions from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, sports, millions to superstarhood. Uh, to the general economy, although interestingly, Karim Abdul-Jabbar says, I am not willing to see the negotiation because I don't want to degrade the NBA and the ABA officials. It's degrading to negotiate. Six years later, Barbara Walters already essentially accepts the first million dollar uh, uh, package as a news reporter, and the whole story of the New York Times essentially lays out all the theory that five years later will be published by Sherwin Rosen in the American Economics Review as the Economics of Superstars. Critically though, this is not technologically driven. Walter Cronkite retires making the nominal million dollars, and then 15 years, and, and then 30 years later, or 25 years later, Katie Couric is hired at a inflation adjusted seven times the, the amount of money with half the people observed. It's about status competition and full convertibility of money to status that's going on, and it's a broad cultural change. Let me move on uh, to talk about the present or the future. In 1996, two groups of software engineers understood that the web was critical. One was Microsoft, the biggest software company in the world, the biggest company in the world, and understood it's the next model. The second was a group of volunteer academics who picked a model based on the commons where no one owned the inputs or the outputs and everyone was free to share, copy, distribute as they wished. No reasonable economist would have predicted that the latter had any chance of adoption in a free market. None certainly would have predicted that over two cycles of boom and bust, Apache would be the major source of mission critical infrastructure for the web, whereas Microsoft server would decline. The primary increase now is Nginx, which is also free and open source software on the same model, a fully commons based model, an open access based model. Similarly, Wikipedia, I published my first article on Wikipedia when it was about six months old, focused specifically on the fact that it was a purely norm-driven, self-governing community producing effective outputs. Again, no one would have predicted, and yet it moves. What we saw if mapped on the same model based on transactional frameworks, whether they're centralized or decentralized and market-based or non-market, we see essentially the first period we talked about as centralization and formalization of uh, functions in the centralized models. We see the 80s and the 90s as decentralization toward market-based. And what we've seen over the last 20 years is an integration of what people have always done. Be friends, be social, share what they care about, tell a story a friend, out of what is critical to human flourishing in social relations and spilling into economic production. GM didn't have to worry about amateur auto uh, enthusiasts while Microsoft lost the web server market to people who were enthusiastic in that particular way. Um, so essentially it became a solution space and we've seen it happening anywhere from uh, election monitoring in Kenya with uh, uh, Ushahidi uh, through the entire stack of mission critical software 
uh, throughout the system to efforts to include participatory government by allowing citizens to monitor uh, their framework to small business, uh, uh, to entrepreneurs who are harnessing the uh, consumers to do things uh, together to big companies like IBM that in 2000 essentially reinvented itself. Do donated 500 patents to the Free Software Foundation, committed to spend a billion dollars on developing free software, and invented the idea of services sciences in order to build services around the core of commons-based, peer-produced, um, um, uh, information. So this includes two critical components. One is radically decentralized collaboration between large numbers of people that are not coordinated either by hierarchical commands or by prices, but instead by social signals uh, and, 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 uh, and norm-based organization. And the second is a critical commitment to the commons where anyone can produce for the common good and take back out of it without having to ask permission from anyone, including a property owner. We have inventions of new institutions, Richard Stallman's invention of the new general public license, the idea that essentially you use property-like rules, copyright, to create a commons and force uh, sharing. And we see the emergence of that as an approach in the Creative Commons, identifying multiple different ways of uh, connecting social values to property rules. So the CC BY says, you can share this, but you have to give me attribution, means that mine doesn't necessarily mean for, me, for sale. But on the other hand, sharing doesn't mean the erasing of the self. It means that this is not just high theory. These are practical, legally instantiated, technologically mediated relations that reflect specific classes of values. CC by and C says, uh, I, which is to say non-commercial, you can use this but only on a non-commercial basis. I can commercialize it if I want. You can use it for non-commercial services. says, I can share, we can have a robust system of social exchange alongside the market and I can combine the two, et cetera. I, I, I'm, the two papers that I gave you, I'm sorry I didn't know about the, the uh, uh, practice of circulating the talk in advance, so the two papers I gave you are two recent reviews of the literature, both on open commons as opposed to classic Ostrom commons, and on um, um, peer production from the last uh, 12 months or so that I've done that will give more access into the details of this uh, dramatic shift uh, economically. Um, what's happened in the last five or six years is that the same transactions, costs, effects that allowed the development of peer production to emerge and let social behavior become economically effective have been leveraged by a small set of companies, which for a very small period were called sharing economy. Nobody really calls them that anymore. They're on-demand economy. Uh, that's Uber, Lyft, Upwork. Uh, these are network extraction models they essentially take the power of a market actor leveraging the transaction cost effect to decentralize production and replace authority relations and risk absorption by the firm into a precarious market relationship with all sorts of providers, sharing some of the benefits with the consumers and extracting some of the rents for the platform provider. So back to our uh, uh, general model of uh, 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 um, the basic idea, and no worries, I will end exactly on the dot on the time, you don't have to worry. Um, the critical point is fallibilism or practical inquiry in cooperative communities and diversity, or the emergence of homo socialis across a lot wide say, set of disciplines. So if the first framework was the dis difference between Weber and Hayek, the second is rooted in C.S. Peirce's pragmatism and the idea of fallibilism and continuous uncertainty. You find yourself in the moment with all its uncertainties and the way in which you understand the world is through a community of practice. The emergence of the idea of networks as a model of organization associated with Woody Powell in 1990, the emergence of the commons and the possibility, the, the practical empirically observed possibility of people to govern themselves effectively without necessarily state and without necessarily property, uh, and the actual lived experience of internet development uh, and free software. So let me just use the five minutes to give you a few examples, and then uh, we can move to the conversation. 
the Internet Engineering Task Force, this is still today. Anyone can join. Just show up. Dave Clark, who was then heading the IETF, wrote in 1994, we reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. We talk, we argue, show me. Not full consensus, there's no veto, nobody can stop everyone, you can go and do your own thing. Rough consensus and running code becomes a critical component of how this entire set of systems work. If you look at Wikipedia, ethical engagement, ethical engagement as a practical production system. One of the core rules in Wikipedia, assume good faith. Assume good faith, you encounter an action, don't assume the bad man, as Holmes put it. Assume good faith, engage in conversation. But at the end of the day, ignore all rules if they get in the way of making Wikipedia better. The practice and the practical engagement overcomes the formal rule structure while you engage other people uh, as human beings. It means that you have opposing paradigms for how to deal with uncertainty and complexity, and most important what comes out of these frameworks, and that's more developed in the open, open and information commons paper I distributed to you, is that prices and property are as lossy in terms of information. They lose as much information about the complexity of the real world as does hierarchy. Each has its own advantages in different ways, and each has its own failures by comparison to social relations. There is no single model of organization that is ideal. There is diversity and experimentation between them, consistent with the idea of subsidiarity or polycentricity, not only in location, but also in mode. This is not just about the utopians who share things for free. Agile software is probably the most cutting edge business management model of software development coming out of the need to leverage learning relationships and adaptive conditions under rapid enough change that planning and prediction either for hierarchical management or for pricing is too weak. So we believe in individuals and interactions over processes and tools working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. The critical point here, it's a zeitgeist. It's a change in conception of how to run a good business alongside a change in conception of how to uh, uh, um, manage uh, a social production system. The nature of rationality we've seen in the last 20 years, massive change in the shift from homo economicus functioning with self-interest with guile to homo socialis with diverse pro-social motivations, from the idea that atomistic coordinations through thin signals in prices, that is to say competition, to cooperation, much more socially embedded uh, and engaged, and from separable motivational vectors where you can just deal with the money and then the rest doesn't matter, to non-separable motivations. If you pay people money to donate blood, you get less, not more. And the critical empirical work that's been done uh, around that uh, um, uh, across multiple uh, uh, systems. If you look, for example, at evolution, 60s and 70s, it's all around how you interpret actually observed cooperation through a self-interested perspective. If you look at the last decade, it's all about how you understand cooperation as a critical component of evolution. You shift from Dawkins in 76 reporting correctly on the state of the disciplines. Be warned that if you wish, as I do, to build a society in which individuals cooperate generously and unselfishly towards a common good, you can expect little help from biological nature. Let us try to teach generosity and altruism because we are born selfish. To Martin Novak in Science in 2006, Perhaps the most remarkable aspect of evolution is its ability to generate cooperation in a competitive world. Thus, we might add natural cooperation as a third fundamental principle of evolution beside mutation and natural selection. You see this occurring in behavioral economics, behavioral experimental, econo experiment, uh, behavior, uh, experimental psychology, organization. This change occurs throughout and then is ramified in organizational practices, high commitment, high performance organizations, good jobs, a whole bunch of disciplines.
you see a move from uniformity to diversity on motivations of organizational forms and of institutions. And you see the emergence of online young people committed to cooperativism, platform cooperativism, open cooperativism. You see entrepreneurial kids trying to build firms around these values that understand themselves as trying to do something meaningful in the world with each other, recognizing each other as human beings and re-embedding production in social relations rather than trying to optimize the tear between economy and society. This, I think, is the core hope for an alternative to economic nationalism. Thank you.